Hey, thank you for joining everyone. My name is Ethan Rido. I'm a technical marketing manager here at Desktop Metal. And today we're going to be talking about additive manufacturing versus casting and how additive manufacturing can assist or complement uh, the casting industry. So as many of you probably already know, uh, casting is a very common traditional manufacturing method used to make these complex shapes that would otherwise be very difficult or uneconomical to make by other method methods. You know, it can be used across a wide different variety of volumes, as well as part sizes, as I'm sure you can see on the screen here. It's good for, you know, both small parts and very large parts, everything from, you know, small volume between one and 10 to very, very high volumes with die casting with, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of parts each. Uh, of course, traditional manufacturing, uh, like casting, carries some challenges with it, and those challenges have, uh, you know, some negative implications. Uh, when we're talking to our casting customers, it's very common for us to hear about very long lead times, uh, generally eight to 14 weeks for, you know, their first castings to come back from the foundry, and usually that is due to the tooling. You know, for each different geometry you want to make, you have to have molds, you have to do wax injection, you have to, if you're doing die casting, you have to have these hard tools made uh, that are, you know, obviously take a very, very long time and require highly skilled labor. Uh, associated with those tools also comes with lots of non reincurring engineering costs, both in the design of that tooling, as well as the fabrication of that tooling. Uh, you know, when you're actually doing the casting process, generally it's a relatively industrial process. So for, for most engineers and manufacturers, casting is not something you're going to be doing in-house yourself. Uh, you know, if you're a designer, there's often quite a bit of distance between where you're doing the actual casting uh, and the parts actually being designed, which leads to some logistical challenges, as you can imagine. What are the results of this challenge, of these challenges? Generally, you're seeing months to bring up a production line from the, from the day the design is approved to the parts are actually being produced, you're seeing months of gap uh, in between those two you know, states of design. Uh, you see lots less design iteration because once a design is finalized, you really can't make any changes to that casting. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna have to restart these long lead times associated with tooling. Uh, oftentimes, you see people who are sacrificing their design optimization in order to get ease of manufacturing. I commonly refer to this as, you know, kind of bending to the will of your manufacturing method, where you're more worried about, is this going to be able to be cast affordably and efficiently, than is this the optimized geometry for my application? And with a lot of some traditional manufacturing methods, there's this need for high quantities in order to amortize your tooling costs, where you can't justify these lower volumes with some casting methods, because you need to offset that very, very high cost that you invested in that tooling. Well, today we're mostly talking about casting. These challenges and results are really true for almost all traditional manufacturing methods, whether we're talking about machining or powder metallurgy, like Preston Sinnott or MIM, you know, these same challenges and these same results uh, really carry, you know, weight in, in a lot of traditional manufacturing methods. Of course, today, we're not just here to talk about challenges and, and complain about challenges. We're here to talk about solutions and metal 3D printing offers lots of solutions. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about metal 3D printing as a complement to casting, uh, about how it can assist uh, your traditional casting methods, and then also about metal 3D printing as a replacement to casting and some applications where you can actually just replace your foundry, replace the option of casting with metal 3D printing. When we're talking about metal 3D printing as a complement to casting, we're more talking about lower volumes, things like replacement parts, pilot runs, maybe some specialized orders where you need to have a new geometry, even things like prototyping, but now we're doing it in metal. We'll look at a few examples of this and explain how metal 3D printing can add value when you're talking about lower volumes, when you're complementing casting. Then we'll talk briefly about metal 3D printing as a replacement to casting. Here we're talking about higher volumes, we're talking about mass production, but of course without the need for any tooling. Uh, we'll be talking about this in terms of binder jetting and the ability to mass produce print parts uh, on demand without tooling to replace those parts that you were traditionally casting. The two printers we're going to be talking about today, both of course produced by Desktop Metal, is the Studio System. Studio System is the right behind me. You can see here the world's first office-friendly metal 3D printing system. It's great for those low-volume applications, like I mentioned, as the complement, functional prototyping, jigs and fixtures, rapid tooling, replacement parts. It's very safe for the office. It's fully automated workflow and has quite a few materials available to it uh, to help you with no matter what the application you have. When we're talking about the higher volumes in the binder jetting systems, we're going to be talking about the shop system. You can see it uh, to my left here. The shop system is uh, great for batch production of end use parts, much higher throughput than the studio system. You're producing hundreds of parts per day. It's still very, very accessible and easy to use, uh, a plug and play system, but you're getting these fully dense isotropic parts that are great for end use applications with the benefit of being able to produce 
hundreds of parts per day without tooling. And I have a bunch of examples with me here on my desk here that we'll be looking at today and talking about how those are adding value uh, compared to casting. So let's start with metal 3D printing as a complement to casting. Uh, starting with talking about prototyping and pilot runs. Uh, you know, of course, this is prototyping is probably the most common application for 3D printing, especially in plastic 3D printing. But now we're not just prototyping to perform and fit, we can actually functionally test our components. You know, we can print functional metal parts during the development stage of the production to validate our design before placing our casting order. So we can do things like testing our parts under high loading, high heat, corrosion environments to actually understand how our geometry is gonna perform rather than does it just fit into my machine. Uh, we refer to this as functional prototyping. And of course, this adds lots of value because now we're able to really understand how our geometry performs and if it's optimized before sending it off to be mass produced. A good example of this is this worm gear speed reducer mounting flange. Uh, this is a part that eventually will be cast in high volumes, but during the prototyping stage, it is beneficial to print this geometry uh, on the studio system to understand how this is gonna perform. You may wanna print a few different flanges of different sizes so we can test different motors to really understand uh, what's our best geometry to go to mass production with. Uh, this part was printed in 4140, a uh, low alloy seal, giving it you know excellent hardness for, for different mounting scenarios. Uh, printed on the studio system for just $427 in comparison to, you know, if you were to produce this part with uh, CNC machining as an alternative, it's going to cost over $1,000, where here I can just, you know, take my file, throw it on the printer, and in a couple of days, I have my mounting flange ready to go. Uh, you know, an example of a great example of a prototype here before I move to mass production with casting. Another great example is replacement parts. Many parts today have these lifetime service agreements where you know, you're guaranteeing your customers replacement parts for the entire life uh, that that you know, machine or, or geometry is in service. You know, so companies either need to warehouse these components or they need to keep manufacturing lines running or they have to look for a new manufacturing alternative so they can ensure that their customers are always having access to these parts. Uh, of course, 3D printing is an excellent alternative because now we're able to do what's called a digital warehouse, a digital inventory. Rather than having to store hard goods and, and store tooling to potentially make these geometries that we haven't made in many years when a customer needs a replacement, all I have to do is pull a file, throw it on the printer, and a couple of days, I'm ready to send it out to my customer as a replacement part. A really good example of this is this break housing that I have with me here today. Uh, you know, relatively large part. Uh, you can see the original cast component on the right there. Then you can see the version that was printed on the studio system. Uh, this is actually a brake housing. It's used to integrate multiple different moving components in this brake assembly uh, in a quite a large articulating machine. Uh, again, you know, originally this part was cast in very high volumes, but you know, now they're no longer making this component, but they still have a need for a few replacements every year. So what do they do? Rather than keeping that casting line, that foundry up and running, making this geometry that they really don't need in high volumes anymore, they don't have to worry about tooling anymore. They don't have to worry about the demand. The cost is going to stay flat. So again, this part's printed in 4140 for about $1,000 in the studio system uh, compared to what was going to cost almost $2,500 to be CNC machined. Uh, simply, you know, throw the file on the printer, send it out to the customer in a few days. I know I'm going to say that a lot today, but 3D printing really makes it easy uh, for these replacement parts. All right, now we're going to switch over, just kind of talk about metal 3D printing as a replacement to casting. Uh, hopefully you've seen a few examples there of where metal 3D printing can assist with your casting. We're talking about prototyping and replacement parts, more on the low volume end. But what about metal 3D printing actually to replace parts that you're going to be casting in high volumes? We already briefly talked about this earlier, but one of the main challenges uh, with casting is the ramp up. You have these extremely high long foundry lead times and these extremely high NRE costs, uh, making it really uh, only cost effective for these very, very high volumes. But even when you're at those high volumes, uh, you're really only able to, uh, you still have these very, very long lead times and high costs and uh, NRE costs associated with the process. When we're looking at casting, I just want to make a quick comparison to how this compares to the binder jetting process. Uh, you know, for the casting process, when we talk to our casting customers, they generally say that the setup time from design finalization to actual production is about four months. Uh, what this entails is, you know, of course, quite a bit of 14 weeks generally of prep, 
between mold design, approval from the customer, there's quite a bit of iteration, the actual cutting or creation of the mold. And then there's actually, of course, you know, the actual production. This is comparing an investment casting process where you need to do that at wax injection, slurry coating, knockout, the actual casting process and baking, then generally casting requires quite a bit of post-processing. So you're looking at about, you know, four months of time between design finalization and parts actually being shipped out to the customer. Important thing to note, what happens now if the design changes? This timeline greatly extends because I have to go back and I have to start these processes over. If I'm lucky, I can make a change to the design, I can make a modification to the mold, but many times you may have to start over, a new design has to be created and fabrication has to start again, incurring lots of costs and lots of lead time, of course. How does this compare to binder jetting? You know, binder jetting, our customers generally say it's, you know, about a one to two week process uh, from when you start, uh, you know, printing to actually sending out parts to the customer. You know, you may need to do a little bit of iteration on the designs to ensure that you're getting the exact geometry you want. But again, from four months down to just one to two weeks because we simply print, depowder, center, and in a few days, you can have hundreds of geometries ready to go to send out to your customer or to iterate on, but that iteration is taking three days instead of four months. Of course, again, now what happens if the design changes? Uh, no longer do I need to, uh, you know, make huge changes to my tools. All I need to do is make changes to my file, make changes to my SCL, send it to the printer, and in a few days, I can have hundreds of parts. This allows things for like mass customization to be highly, highly agile and never be locked into a design just because I've already been invested in tooling. So binder jetting really allows for mass production without tooling. One question a lot of you probably have is what makes mass, what makes binder jetting so great for mass production? And binder jetting has really emerged as a key technology for mass production. Why? It has this very, very high throughput because it uses area-wide raster-based 3D printing rather than uh, you know, vector-based processes that are single point. We can print you know, entire layers of a volume, these very large volumes, in just a few seconds, making it very, very fast to print. Uh, you know, we use these very, very low cost materials from an established metal injection molding supply chain, which gives a very, very broad range of materials, as well as material properties that are already used and expected. You get these isotropic material properties thanks to the sintering process, and then it's very, very scalable because you can very, very quickly change build box sizes and use the same technology. Again, very, very low waste, of course, because any material that's not printed can be reused and printed again. You can see the print process here, and you can see how we're able to spread over an entire build volume in just a few seconds. And you can see with each pass of that print head, we're able to lay down an entire layer, allowing for multiple parts to be printed in just a few seconds per layer. Uh, the first part we're gonna look at here is this rocker arm. This is used for opening and closing the intake valves on an outboard engine. Uh, this part was printed on our shop system, the system you can see over my left. Of course, you know, this needed to be made out of metal for, you know, adequate strength and stiffness as well as temperature resistance requirements. Uh, this part was actually printed in 316L. Uh, you can see that, you know, on, on the, oh, sorry, this was actually printed on the production system. On the production system, the cost is just $4.75 per part. So we're really able to get that cost per part down to a, to a, to a low enough that we're really able to compete with casting. Uh, this part's able to do, do over 330 parts per build and over 570,000 of these parts per year. So you can see we're really able to get that cost down and that volume up to allow us to compete with traditional casting. Another part we're going to look at here is this stator. You know, this is designed for use, you know, with a small electric motor. Again, has some difficult geometry to it, which would be make it quite difficult and expensive to cast and also very, very expensive for, uh, you know, the machining process. But again, can produce this part for just $4.48, over 274 of them per build, over 400,000 of these parts uh, per year. So a great example of, uh, you know, really, really driving down that cost and upping that throughput to allow for very, very high volume of these nice uh, binder jet geometries as a replacement to casting. So, so far we've really talked about what is a one-to-one -one comparison uh, from casting to uh, 3D printing. But one thing that really excites me is that 3D printing really opens up the, this possibility of new design freedoms. Parts that you would never be able to cast because they're just not possible, but are very, very simple for us to print. You know, this enables us to do very, very new innovative designs, but now with binder jetting, we can actually mass produce these geometries. 
For example, you see this pedal here, you know, the original design might be quite blocky, quite generic because it's gonna be cast or machine, but with additive manufacturing, we can pull all that weight out and get this very, very organic shape that only weighs 586 grams now. Then we can actually mass produce those parts because we can print hundreds of them per day with binder jetting to actually go to market with one of these optimized designs that you can never justify with machining or casting. A good example of that here is this uh, gear I have with me here. You can see that that you know that all the internals in there that aren't experiencing any stress because they're not the teeth are all able to be lattice to greatly reduce the weight of this part. Right. This is a geometry that's been highly optimized, but would be extremely expensive to produce with other manufacturing methods. But now with the production system, you can produce over 100 of these parts in just four hours. So it's actually possible to go to market with a complicated design uh, like this. Another great example of this is assembly consolidation. You know, so many parts today are designed for their manufacturing method more so than they are their uh, application. You know, for example, this roller screw that I have here traditionally is designed as seven uh, different components just because it's easier to make those seven parts individually than it would be to consolidate them all into one assembly. With 3D printing, we have a new design where we can assemble, uh, you know, consolidate all those parts into one geometry. And again, it's not just that we're going to print one of these. Now we can print hundreds of these parts per day, thousands of these parts, you know, per week or year. And we can actually go to market with geometries that are highly optimized with consolidated assemblies, of course, reducing our bombs in, uh, in making our inventories far easier to manage and actually leading to a higher performance part. You can see an example on screen here. That's a 16 liter build of the shop system. And you can see I can fit, you know, hundreds of these parts in them uh, per build. So I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, how do these parts actually perform though? Is it, you know, how do they compare to a cast component? You know, is it a one-to-one -one comparison? Uh, no, but let me explain to you a little bit about our properties and how they actually exceed those of a cast component and why this is, you know, opens up so many new exciting designs. Uh, one great advantage of sintering is it, is it creates these dense polymer-free metal uh, parts. You know, since we're raising uh, the parts to temperature all uniformly, the parts have a, no history of its original powder metal origin, and the grains have grown larger than those original powder particles, leading to this homo, homogeneous microstructure. Uh, this makes sintered powdered metal parts very, very attractive for industrial applications because they're isotropic. There's no memory of that original binder material. There's no memory of that, that it was ever a powder part before, making it really, really interesting and really, really uh, exciting for industrial applications because you're going to get the material properties that you expect. You know, looking at a 17.4 uh, pH stainless steel uh, printed on our shop system, you can see that yield strength uh, just off the printer is about 660 megapascals, gets all the way up to 980 with the heat treatment. Compared to a metal injection mold component, you can see that we're exceeding those MPI F35 standards, uh, ensuring that these parts are, you know, excellent for in these industrial processes. When looking at density uh, on the studio system, it, it depends a little bit on the material. On our, you know, carbon, carbon steels, uh, you know, we're about uh, 90, 94%, 93.5% and higher on 17.4 pH stainless steel. We're up to, you know, 98% dense. So similar to a cast component or if not higher, uh, depending on the casting method. On the shop system, uh, we're achieving densities on 17.4 pH of over 98%, making it a great material uh, for a wide variety of different applications. And of course, uh, if you want to hear more about our specific material properties, you can head over to our website and all of our material data sheets are available for download to understand the exact material properties you're going to get from each of our printed uh, materials. One great example here is this example of a binder jetting versus cast component. Uh, this is a part that needed to be cycled for 1 million times and uh, withstand at least 273 inch pounds of torque. Uh, this part was originally being cast, but the customer wanted to see it. Can I replace this geometry with a printed geometry and get the results that I need? Uh, the answer was yes. You can see the results here uh, with the cast component. It was able to withstand 350 inch pounds of torque. The binder jet component that was printed on the shop system was able to withstand 429 inch pounds. So it exceeded that of the cast component and it generously exceeded that of the requirement for the part. When it came to fatigue, uh, it needed to withstand 1 million cycles. The cast part, while well, it did pass, we experienced lots of uh, deformation. The binder jet part, of course, passed as well, but with very, very little to no deformation, actually exceeding that of the cast component and, of course, exceeding the requirements of the part needed. So when it comes to comparing a part to that of a cast component, generally you're seeing material properties that are exceeding those of a, the same material that's being cast. 